we don't change. We're doing the same thing today, but under different names. We can look back at those people and see how evil that was, but we can't see it in ourselves. So therefore, beware of virtue. In the digital age, the incessant calls to action reverberate across the virtual landscape, summoning legions of fervent warriors to wage battles against perceived evils. This rallying cry echoing the urgency of a multitude of crusades permeates our online existence. Be it the casual dehumanization of entire swathes of people, to the slow deterioration of language through constant decries of racist and pedo and any ist or phobe you care to imagine. Everything is a conflict now, a conquest, a campaign against the devil himself. We do not treat cancer, we fight it. We do not discuss climate change, we fight it. It is not enough to not be racist, you have to fight against racism. The fight against homelessness, the fight against heart disease, the fight against hate. That's a novel one. The internet has become a constant battlefield where zeal and fury and bold, untenable posturing are prized virtues. Amidst this cacophony, a troubling pattern emerges. The call to arms is always fueled by fear, anger, outrage, and the demonization of specific or sometimes not so specific groups of human beings. It is a grand mobilization, an ever present summons to fight against perceived devils, urging countless brave soldiers to embark on a crusade. Yet, as we heed these calls, it is essential to question the consequences of blind action and reflect on the historical echoes that warn of the perils of unchecked zeal. The echoes of the Crusades, with their rallying cry of Deus Vault, resonate through history as a stark illustration of the corrupt motivations and hypocritical hubris that underpins the Catholic Church's actions. Pope Urban II's proclamation, ostensibly on God's behalf, invoked the commandment, Thou shalt not kill, revealing a selective interpretation that conveniently exempted Christians from guilt when frisking non-Christians, particularly the Saracens poetically emphasized here. From the hand of Pope Urban, the second of his name, and woe betide any who reckon this claim is anything but what God wills it to be, a new holy order from our holy trinity. For we've all heard the commandments, those tablets of yore, ten holy orders which holy are law. But we need to understand what God meant very clearly, for a footnote's been lost, I believe, quite severely. For when the Lord ordered that thou shalt not kill, he only meant Christians. The rest, well, do as you will. Hugs and kisses to all, a new day has reckoned. Feel free to kill Muslims now, signed Pope Urban II. This allowed the ranks of Christendom to murder indiscriminately, to rape and burn and pillage and all without any worry of eternal damnation. God wills it, after all. If he didn't, it would not be, just like Jesus always wanted. The Inquisition, marked by the belief that any means were justified in curing heresy, stands as another chapter in the annals of humanity's capacity for cruelty under the guise of righteousness. The pursuit of saving souls led to the performance of malicious and evil acts with little resistance from a populace largely convinced of the righteousness of the cause. The Inquisition serves as a chilling reminder of how, when fueled by the fear of damnation, individuals and institutions can so easily justify atrocities in the name of a greater good. The pernicious mantra of Manifest Destiny unfolded a chapter of history marred by such atrocities, betrayals and land grabs, particularly in the Americas. The decimation of indigenous peoples, the wholesale slaughter of buffalo herds and the misguided attempts at forced assimilation by the self-righteous virtue signalers of their day underscored the destructive consequences of ideological fervour. Native American children were forcibly taken from their families, herded to Christian schools, beaten and punished if they spoke their native language or practiced their own spiritual beliefs. 
the notion that these people were obstacles to progress justified unspeakable acts carried out in the full belief that divine right was on their side, and the kindest, most virtuous do-gooders flocked to be the ones to beak the decency and civility into these savages. One saint can be caring, impassioned and empathic, but if they proliferate, they somehow inevitably turn into a mob of self-righteous fools, a catastrophe, a plague of saints, as Aaron Watts would say a plague that will stop at nothing to fix a world that's not broken. All for the world's own good, you understand. Some viewers might find it unfair that I've chosen three Christian examples, but rest assured, these are just historical instances I'm familiar with. I'm not naive enough to believe that the rhetoric of lesser evil for greater good is exclusive to Catholic self-righteousness. It extends beyond religion to various other ideologies. Religion can be used as a tool for tyrants, but they have many at their disposal, including nationalism, patriotism, and other mob-stirring isms. War is universal, and war, war never changes. In contemplating the propaganda of the past, one cannot help but wonder why recognising similar patterns in contemporary narratives proves so challenging to so many people. The impulse to improve the world driven by a zealous desire to fix perceived wrongs paradoxically leads to the destruction of the very world one aims to improve, just as much now as ever. As the digital landscape continues to summon legions to innumerable crusades, any and all perceivable societal ills, be they stoked by religious propaganda, nationalist propaganda, or any propaganda you care to mention, the result is always the same. We're making all the same mistakes. We can see the tyrannies and propaganda of yesterday and condemn it as heinous, as downright evil, and yet, rarely do we see it in today, nor often in ourselves. The echoes of the Crusades, the horrors of the Inquisition and the atrocities of the colonial era serve as a stark reminder that the road to hell is often paved with good intentions, and that just because we feel our cause is just, through us, the devil might be acting out his interests. It is a good time to ask yourself, is my righteous fervour real, or has it been stoked deliberately by someone or something that wants sparks flying in as many directions as possible? Have I been corrupted into a mob, my fury fueling some more insidious agenda? I guarantee you have more in common with those devils on the other side than you care to imagine. In a world where the call to action permeates every corner of our lives, the challenge lies in discerning when the fight against perceived devils becomes ideological or dogmatic. Here are a few rules I try to live by. Never dehumanise anyone, whether they deserve it or not. Carry yourself and your opinions with a pinch of levity. Don't take anything personally. And be as honest as you can be especially with yourself. And so, as we navigate the complexities of human nature and the intricacies of the world around us, let us heed the wisdom of the ages. The highest virtue is not conscious of itself as virtue. It is the quiet humility of breathing, the simple act of living, and the profound appreciation of the miracles that surround us. For in our quest for righteousness, let us not become ensnared in the trappings of ego and conceit, let us embrace the true essence of virtue, not as a badge of honour to be won proudly and suitably lauded, but as a guiding light to illuminate our separate paths through the darkness. That is how good is best served, in the real, tangible change that comes about when one stops fighting against the world and starts living as part of it. Thank you for listening. I am a fantasy author, designer and illustrator. If you'd like to help support my projects, you can find my fantasy work here. Also, a big thank you to my faithful supporters across Patreon and PayPal. If you'd like to become part of this small but growing community, be sure to subscribe, click the little bell and check out my first book, The Farmer and the Fold, available on paper and pixel on Amazon. Thanks again.